Thank you to Fanulini Ornla actually for just swip, swapping the times a little bit, and I'm grateful. I'm also grateful that I'm not speaking to her slides, which I would likely not understand. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just have um, give a brief overview of some exciting diabetes research that we are undertaking um, at RCSI as part of the Perinatal Ireland Research, Research Consortium and now the um, Clinical Trials Network in, in perinatal uh, medicine in, um, nationally. So the Ireland study, um, and we worked hard to get this acronym, um, took quite some time, but we're very happy with it, um, is, involves investigating the role of early low-dose aspirin in pre-gestational diabetes, okay? So we're not invest, this is not a study of our much larger gestational diabetes population, but rather of those women that we look after who have true pre-gestational um, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, so. so just by way of illustrating the type of patient that we're currently looking after um, in our service, um, this is a lady who came to us a couple of years ago with her first pregnancy, a 34-year-old nulliparous woman who had type 1 diabetes since childhood, which had been poorly controlled since childhood with recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia likely um, uh, throughout her adolescence in particular, um, uh, to, to the point of subtle cognitive impairment, I would say. Um, so that her diabetes was incredibly difficult to control for us. Um, chronic hypertension was identified at 13 weeks gestation and she was commenced on labetalol. Um, she also had quite significant um, and accelerating diabetic retinopathy. Um, and we admitted her at 34 weeks gestation, which might have been her eighth or ninth admission to the hospital for glucose stabilization. But on this occasion, she had new onset preeclampsia. Um, but was normotensive and was just new proteinuria. So um, in spite of her very controlled blood pressure and her lack of symptoms, we planned to schedule her for a caesarean section at 36 weeks and five days gestational age um, for uh, no reason other than that the combination of preeclampsia and type 1 diabetes is a combination that we consider to be extraordinarily high risk. And there is no value in um, pursuing those pregnancies past 36 weeks. So that was our plan, which was a Monday operating list. And she remained in hospital for that, I suppose, almost two weeks from diagnosis to delivery. And unfortunately, on the Saturday morning, at a time when she was having a routine daily CTG monitoring done, and again, normal blood pressure, no symptoms, her CTG was pre-terminal. And, uh, and this was it, actually. Um, so she required a category 1 cesarean section, and her baby was in extraordinarily poor condition of birth, um, and was effectively like a resuscitated stillbirth and died very early in the neonatal period. Um, and this was attributed at post-mortem examination, and indeed at the time of surgery, to a large placental abruption, which had caused her no pain likely because of associated diabetic neuropathy. Um, so she didn't behave like a placental abruption in, in a non-diabetic woman. Um, 12 weeks postpartum, this woman had ischemic chest pain presented to Beaumont and was identified as having significant three-vessel disease and required angiographic stenting. And remember, this is a 34-year-old. Um, so she came to me maybe a couple of months later for preconception consultation. So extraordinarily keen, understandably so, to achieve um, another pregnancy and a healthy baby. Um, but she came to us on dual antiplatelet therapy, prosequel and uh, aspirin, um, omeprazole, bisoprolol, um, an antidepressant, um, a statin, and eltroxin, as well as her insulin pump, which was not being managed wonderfully. Um, and we tend to think in this day and age that actually um, we can pretty much take anybody through pregnancy. Um, and sometimes m are probably guilty of making it look a little bit too easy. So while we here in this room might be appalled at the 
medical irresponsibility of this um, of, of whoever achieved a pregnancy for this 70 something year old couple um, it is sobering to think that the patient of ours that I just described probably has the cardiovascular health of this woman and, um, and you could make the same argument about our responsibility in, um, in, in taking these women through pregnancy. I mean, that, that type of um, arteriopathy um, is, results in a situation where um, this woman will do well to see her children through secondary school. Um, and not just this 70-year-old woman, but also our 34-year-old patient with um, uh, very significant um, uh, arteriopathy as a consequence of very, very long-standing type 1 diabetes. Um, and yet, of course, uh, she did become pregnant, um, as was always going to be the case, and uh, happily, we took her recently through a uh, long and tough um, and uh, pregnancy, but that worked out well in the end. Um, but uh, not after a lot of uh, heartache on our point, very prolonged hospitalization, and typically a, a hospital chart that almost needed to be wheeled around in a trolley, which is always a bad sign. Um, so type 1 and type 2 diabetes are much more dominant and prevalent in our working lives now than they would have been in the past. If you look at the annual report from 1950, there were five cases in this hospital of type 1 diabetes. That instance hasn't actually, um, or that, that prevalence of type 1 diabetes hasn't changed a whole lot at all. It's an autoimmune disease that generally presents itself in childhood. Um, but type 2 diabetes was either non-existent or just unrecognized um, at that time. And they would have had one death. So um, similarly, a decade later, um, in 1970, three women with diabetes are, di are described in the annual report, one of whom died of a respiratory distress syndrome. Um, and one was a stillbirth, actually, so that should be that they only had one survivor, actually, that's an error there. Um, and they described the one survivor having made excellent progress after 13 weeks in hospital. So the, our patient that I described, probably if you clocked up all of her hospital admissions, they would approach something close to 13 weeks. Um, uh, interestingly, as recently as 1980, and um, you know, lots of us would consider 1980 to be relatively recent, um, there are, there's no t detail on, um, specifically on diabetes in that there's no separate section for women with diabetes and they're just listed under miscellaneous maternal complications. Um, so in 2014, we looked after 53 women with pre-gestational diabetes, 60% um, of whom have type 2 diabetes um, and we had one perinatal mortality. So. This particularly high group tends sometimes to be eclipsed by the vastly larger population of women with gestational diabetes, which is currently around 650 per annum. And they are a very different entity and shouldn't be discussed in the same breath as women with pre-gestational diabetes. Um, they have minor degrees of carbohydrate intolerance in pregnancy, most of them, and most of them should be managed with diet and exercise. Um, so we have divorced those two populations as much as we can in order to allow us to provide um, a, a more nuanced and targeted service to uh, the women who are truly high risk. Um, and it's not understood clearly why these women have such high perinatal mortality rates, which are generally reported as three to four percent, and that would be our experience um, if we look after uh, typically about 40 women with pre-gestational diabetes in a year, we will ha very typically have one very typically late uh, intrauterine death. Um, sometimes despite meticulous glycemic control and meticulous fetal surveillance, uh, typically at around 36 weeks gestational age, all of a sudden there's no fetal cardiac activity. And we scan these women every week from 34 weeks right up until delivery uh, and sometimes more often. But uh, although that makes us feel better, it's likely that it doesn't impact their outcome at all. Um, 
And we have to assume that the placenta is responsible for you know, the fate of the vast majority of pregnancies, certainly in a normally formed baby. Um, and while it has a trophic role in facilitating fetal growth, it also has a significant endocrine and metabolic role. And while type 1 and type 2 diabetes in themselves are very different entities, they do share a role in, um, in, in, in the, the vasculature difficulties that are faced for both conditions. They share that arteriop arteriopathic tendency, these women. Um, so pre-gestational diabetes confers really an unacceptably high perinatal mortality rate in the order of 30 to 40 women per thousand, which would be tenfold the background population risk. Um, and preeclampsia rates are between 20 and 25%. Um, and as I said, it is that particular combination of preeclampsia and pre-gestational diabetes that places women at particular risk for stillbirth. Um, the etiology for preeclampsia in all cases, but including in this subgroup, is, remains unclear. But we do know that placental dysfunction is central to the disease process. Um, and that that placental dysfunction sets in early in the first trimester, followed months later by the clinical manifestations of preeclampsia that reflect endothelial dysfunction, vasoconstriction, end organ ischemia, and increased vascular permeability, resulting in the kind of edema that is typical of somebody with um, impressive preeclampsia. Um, so while hypertensive disorders or preeclampsia are not responsible for all diabetes-related deaths. For certain, any potential to reduce placental dysfunction in this particular high-risk group merits very close attention. And it is because of a collective interest in our group, in this particular high-risk group, that um, the, the Ireland study evolved, which involves investigating the role of early low-dose aspirin in women with pregestational diabetes. Low-dose aspirin has been investigated for the prevention of preeclampsia for quite some time, owing to its negative effect on thromboxane production, um, which should, in theory, protect against vasoconstriction, because we know that an imbalance between prostacyclin, which is a vasodilator, and thromboxane, a vasoconstrictor, um, that, that that imbalance plays a key role in the development of preeclampsia, resulting in shallow placental invasion and ischemia. And the key here is that that all has happened very early in gestation. So that the fate of a diabetes pregnancy, um, certainly one that is destined to develop, to develop preeclampsia, that fate is sealed in the first trimester. Um, and so the role of aspirin in preventing preeclampsia in high-risk women, that has been investigated for many years and, and yielded conflicting results. So this table just outlines a flavor of the type of studies that have been done in this field. Um, and the early studies in the 1980s actually um, demonstrated quite impressive dramatic benefits to, to uh, low-dose aspirin in preventing preeclampsia. Um, subsequently, and very typically, much larger scale studies were disappointing um, and failed to demonstrate an overall benefit, um, most likely because often it is the case that a, that a larger study casts the net a little bit too wide and ends up recruiting um, a large group of women that are actually at pretty low risk for developing disease, so that the outcomes of the majority of your cohort are actually pretty, end up being pretty uninformative. Um, the one group that, um, uh, without question, has been shown to demonstrate from, uh, to, to benefit from low dose aspirin are those women who have experienced severe early onset preeclampsia in a prior pregnancy. Um, and, and, and other groups have, studies on other groups have been disappointing and it is, it is very typical that when a benefit is demonstrated for one particular subgroup, um, then that, and the same is true of, for instance, progesterone for preventing preterm labor, is that all of a sudden this intervention is being used for others without really any um, uh, randomized trial evidence, certainly of a benefit. Um, so that tends to be a case of 
you know, if all you have is a, is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know. So, well, aspirin is beneficial in this particular subgroup, why not give it to everybody? And there is an argument that that might be considered, and that's what the test study, which is being led by Fanula McAuliffe in National Maternity, is, is kind of about that. It's about giving low-dose aspirin actually to all um, pregnant women, all nulliparous women, in the same way that they would take folic acid. Um, now, so some meta-analyses have been, have looked specifically, have pooled all of these studies, uh, the first being a Cochrane review in 2004 that was repeated in 2007 and demonstrated a 17% reduction in the incidence of preeclampsia among women perceived to be at increased risk and, and a greater reduction in preeclampsia potentially 25% in women who were considered at particularly high risk. And women with diabetes were included in that group, but it was a very mixed bag of a population. Um, perinatal mortality, there was also a 14% risk reduction demonstrated. Um, and the conclusion of those Cochrane reviews has been persistently that future studies are required to demonstrate which women are most likely to benefit, uh, when it should be started, and at what dose. Similarly, the Paris collaboration, which is um, uh, uh, perinatal antiplatelet review of international studies, is a review of 27 randomized trials, pooling 30, almost 32,000 women, and concluded that aspirin is effective in preventing preeclampsia, although the effect and they quantified it at about 10% across the board, is too modest to one warrant routine use in all women. So that despite a very large data set, the evidence base for particular groups of high-risk women remains limited. And so the group that we're interested in is women with diabetes. Um, and only two studies have specifically um, conducted randomized trials to, to look into the role of aspirin in, in women with, with pregestational diabetes. One, which was an MFMU study in the US, um, included a group of 471 women with type 1 or type 2 diabetes and demonstrated no if difference in preeclampsia instance between the low-dose aspirin and the placebo groups. However, importantly, the mean gestational age at recruitment in these studies was about 18 weeks which we would consider to be a shade late when you're trying to influence placental function because the placental architecture is established and set up long before 18 weeks gestation. Similarly, um, the Paris collaboration looked at um, 905 women in those meta-analyses um, that had pre-existing diabetes. And they demonstrated a relative risk of 0.76 for preeclampsia but confidence intervals that crossed one, so really not significant. Um, and there's no information in that report on gestational age at recruitment, but in the overall meta-analysis, two-thirds of the overall data set were recruited after 20 weeks gestation. And the timing of low-dose aspirin therapy, we believe to be very significant. Um, Roberge in 2013 um, looked at randomized trials of aspirin pre and post 16 weeks and concluded that low dose aspirin again does have the potential to reduce perinatal mortality but only when initiated prior to 16 weeks. So it needs to be started early in gestation before the second act, uh, phase of trophoblast invasion which happens at around about 14 weeks. And the practice of delaying aspirin therapy until a bit later probably stems from the historic conservatism that is common to just uh, prescribing in pregnancy. But no, interestingly, no low randomized trials have investigated the role of aspirin specifically in the prevention of preeclampsia that have initiated um, uh, therapy in the first trimester. So the Ireland study, is a randomized, double-blinded control trial of low-dose aspirin versus placebo initiated in the first trimester of pregnancy for optimizing pregnancy outcome in women with pregestational diabetes. And this is a multi-center study that we are embarking on, hopefully, in 2017 um, at 10 sites across the country, seven tertiary-level perinatal centers, including Belfast, and then three additional peripheral centers that look after a small number of women with diabetes. So the primary objective, and I won't go into the secondary ones because likely we don't have time, 
is um, to investigate the role of aspirin therapy in the first trimester of pregnancy, started typically at about eight weeks gestation, with pregestational type 1 or type 2 diabetes on a composite clinical measure of placental dysfunction that would include preeclampsia, preterm birth before 34 weeks, birth weight below the 10th centile, and perinatal mortality. And I'll skip through the, second, the secondary objectives just in the interests of time. So um, the power calculation is based on the following assumptions. Uh, preeclampsia incidence of 20% in this population, preterm birth rate of 4% in this population, and this is data that we have from our own service and from published studies elsewhere. Um, birth weight less than the 10th percentile you would expect by definition to see in 9% of the population and a perinatal mortality rate of 3%, which seems to be consistent across all services. So um, our power cal calculation would indicate that 283 women will be required in each arm to demonstrate a 35% reduction in that composite clinical measure of placental dysfunction with 80% power. So that's a total study cohort of 566 women, which we hope to be able to recruit nationally in a two and a half year period. Um, Dr. Hala Abu has taken on the pilot phase of this study, which is nearing completion. She certainly completed recruitment, and um, about a third of her cohort has delivered already. Um, and it kind of looks like this. We've screened 46 women, and the screening happens in our service at about five weeks because all of our patients contact the service as soon as they have a positive pregnancy test. And that does result in quite an attrition rate, like we would record a one in three miscarriage rate in this population as a consequence of, you know, uh, um, uh, capturing these women very early on. So there is a loss of about a third of pregnancies. Um, and so not everybody's eligible for recruitment, only a very small number of women are already on aspirin. And then seven women declined to participate. I do believe that these are all women that I spoke to. And then once Hala took over, then as soon as she spoke to a patient, we had a new recruit. So she had, we has some sort of magic wand that, and she's wonderful at it. So I'm very grateful to Hala for taking on the, uh, the recruitment here, and she's doing a fabulous job. Um, so compliance is important, I'll just describe this very briefly, because obviously all randomized trials are fraught and potentially hampered with the inability to really assure compliance, and traditionally that's done with kind of pill counting, which we are doing, diary cards, but truly the patient just has to tick where she's taken her her tablets, and she may well do that in the waiting area while she's waiting to see you, in the, way, in the same way that some of our diabetes patients will, you know, fabricate their sugars in their little diary card, and that does happen. Um, however, uh, we did describe to them from the outset that if they weren't taking their, if they were assigned to take aspirin and they were not taking it, that we would know because we're doing platelet function testing. Um, so every month or so, um, platelet aggregometry is done, and it's actually been very informative and helpful and has been reassuring in demonstrating that the vast majority of people who are randomized to aspirin, this is an open label pilot phase, so it's not blinded. Uh, patients are either on aspirin or not on aspirin. And a patient who is not on aspirin will have that kind of a pattern on the right of uh, um, uh, platelet aggregation, whereas the patient um, who is not on aspirin there is, uh, has a very different pattern with very low uh, platelet reactivity for the duration of time in which she's on aspirin. And then obviously it returns actually very promptly within about seven days once she discontinues her aspirin, uh, typically at about 35 weeks. So in conclusion, this is a very deserving study cohort. It is a, a, without question, the highest risk obstetric population that we look after here. Um, it is an expanding population, particularly the type two women, who um, run extraordinarily high obstetric risk. Um, this intervention is low key, and like I said, there will be a time at which low-dose aspirin is perceived as being just one of your pregnancy vitamins, potentially, um, and that is the direction that, that some research is taking. 
Um, but we've also, I think, demonstrated, and I hope I've articulated to you today, that there is real biologic plausibility to this study, um, and uh, we are very invested in, in completing it. So hopefully the funding is just forthcoming and we are ready to go. So uh, I'll leave you with that image of one of the things that we try to prevent in our service um, uh, is massive macrosomia. And uh, a little while later, Naomi Burke will chat about how to prevent situations where somebody's being expected to, to push a baby of this size. Okay. I probably have time for one or two questions because I haven't been called yet. Thank, thank you, yeah. Fanula.